I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine. How are you? I'm wonderful, too, and I've got the most wonderful costume. Costume for what? For Halloween. Oh, yes, for Halloween. Why, you say that as though you haven't got your costume ready. Well, of course I have, but I didn't know you were talking about a Halloween costume. Well, why not? Well, it isn't very often that grown-ups put on costumes at Halloween. It's just usually the children. Oh, I always do, because next to Christmas, Halloween is my favorite time. Well, next to Christmas, it's my favorite time, too. Except for my birthday, which comes next. Next to what? Next to Christmas. Oh, when is your birthday? Next November. When is it? Next January. And my mother's is next February. And I think it's going to be a broad brick noon lake next to next. <laughs> oh, you say the funniest thing. Well, I know one thing. I'm going to have a wonderful time Halloween night. So am I. What are you going to dress up like? A goblin. What are you going to be? A witch. Okay, I'll meet you on a broomstick right under the moon. Third cloud from the left. All right. I'll be there. Okay, it's a date. <laughs> now, will you please read me the funny? Puck the comic weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. Today, Beetle Bailey and his pal named Killer are on a sightseeing trip. Last picture top row as the bus drives along, the beautiful guide girl begins to point out places along the route. She's talking through a megaphone. Killer, who thinks he's a great guy with the lady, stands up and looks into the megaphone and says... Hey, she's got nice tonsils, too. Beetle sees the girl as angry. Hey, sit down, killer. First picture, bottom row. The girl is pointing out a statue of one of our first settlers. Killer takes a picture of her and says, uh, I'll settle for you, baby. A short time later, the girl guide who is pretty disgusted with Killer by now, is pointing out a famous wishing well. Beetle, who's reading the guidebook, says, Hey, you're supposed to look down it, close your eyes, count to a hundred and make a wish. Killer replies, No, oh, it's a fake. I'll show you. He sticks his head into the well and starts to count. One, two, three, four. Beautiful guide sees Killer with his head in the well and decides here's her chance to get rid of him. So she orders the bus to drive off. And then, third picture, bottom row, Killer makes his wish. I wish I were alone with our guide. And then he pulls his head out of the well, looks around, and sees that the bus with the beautiful girl has disappeared. And he exclaims, Well, I'll be... Hey, where is everybody? Last picture, late that night. He and Beetle are still walking back to town, and Killer says, I told you that well was a fake. It left me alone with you instead of the guide. Beetle replies, Oh, well, the book says the best way to see the country is on foot. <laughs> oh, that was a good joke on Killer. Yes. The girl got tired of that big old smart alec, and so she left him in the well. Yes, but it wasn't fair to leave poor Beetle there, too. <laughs> no, after all, Beetle was nice, but it was awfully funny just the same. Yes, well, now let's turn over the page. <laughs> oh, yes, because Prince Valiant is on page three. And last week, some evil men captured little Prince Arn and ran away with him. And then Tillicum discovered Prince Arn was missing, and she began to follow the trail. That's because she's an Indian and can read the signs of the forest. Oh, I wonder if she finds Prince Arn. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant and the days of King Arthur. Heck it, break it, Grey Malkin and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Oh, 
Swiftly, Tillicum moves along the trail left by the men who have taken Prince on. Last picture, top row, in the forest, she finds a place where bushes are trampled and broken, and in the grass she finds Arne's little bow. Then first picture, second row, she sees the signs of a struggle. Last picture, second row, a marshy spot reveals the tracks of two men, which tells her Arne is being carried. Water in the tracks is clear, so she knows they were made at least an hour ago. She whips off her hampering skirt and begins to run. First picture, bottom row, she finds that the trail leads over a high, rocky spur where tracks do not show. Like a trained hunting dog, she quarters back and forth, back and forth, looking for some sign of their passing. And finally, she finds it. A few scattered, unripe blueberries, far from the nearest berry bush, thrown away by one of the men. Tillicum runs on, knowing that she has the right direction, looking for another sign. Dusk is falling before she crosses the barren ridge to the forest again. And then suddenly she stops. Last picture, her head high. A faint smell comes to her. A smell that is not part of the forest odors. Ooh, maybe she could slip into the camp of those men in the nighttime and get little Prince Arne back again when everybody's asleep. Well, believe me, I hope it works out that way. And we'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, here's Robin Hood. Yes, Robin Hood. And remember the queen had learned that King Richard was captured and was held a prisoner in a far-off country. And they couldn't get him free unless the queen would pay a lot of money to the people who had captured him. And the money has been raised for this purpose, and it's now to be hauled away and sent on a ship to buy Richard's freedom. Yes, and the sheriff now of Nottingham and Prince John, who's trying to become king instead of King Richard, are plotting to steal the gold bag again and blame Robin Hood. Well, let's see what happens next. Here we go with a story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England and days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi-ho! <laughs> After capturing the Maid Marian, so she can't tell Robin Hood what Prince John's plans are. Last picture top row at dawn the next morning, the sheriff instructs the leader of his picked bowmen who are to ambush the queen's convoy of the money. You ride 20 miles down the great road through Sherrod Forest. There you will don outlaw garb and lie in wait. You'll return to the castle with the ransom money in your saddlebags. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, deep within the forest. The bowmen change from sheriff's livery into disguises of Lincoln Green, unaware of being watched by one of Robin's roving sentinels, Will Stutley. Will exclaims to himself, The sheriff's men, setting a snare for the queen's ransom convoy. Robin must be warned. And then he steals from the scene quickly. When he's a safe distance away from the sheriff's men, he fits a red signal arrow to his bow, and third picture, bottom row, sends it whistling toward the outlaw camp. It sails through the air and comes down into a tree at the edge of Robin Hood's camp. Last picture, Robin, the arrow in his hand, exclaims, A summons from Stutley to the south. Robin Hood knows there's something wrong. Yes, you bet. Then Robin and his men will hurry to meet Will Stutley and learn what Will has discovered. And then, when the sheriff's men try to attack the wagon with the gold, I'll just bet you Robin and his men will fix him good. You bet. We'll find that out next week for sure. Now, look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. Roy Rogers. And Roy has discovered that it was Sam Teal who was smuggling the gold from the government Indian reservation. Yes, he's learned that Sam has hidden the gold in a hollow spoke of a wheel on a stagecoach. And last week, you remember that Sam Teal had jumped on the stagecoach after knocking the driver out, and he started to gallop away with the coach. I wonder if Roy will be able to stop him. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by oh Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by <laughs> Sam Teal whips the horses into a gallop to escape with the stagecoach and the gold. Roy, who was inside the relay station, dashes out, sees what's happening, leaps on Trigger. All right, let's go, Trigger. Sam Teal's escaping with that stage and the hidden gold dust. At the edge of town, a herd of cattle blocks the road. Sam, seeing that he can't drive through them, pulls the stagecoach up beside a building, third picture top row, and then climbs onto a second-story balcony, saying, I'll fix hairpin Hobbs and Rogers both. Last picture top row, Roy gallops up. He 
holds a gun on Sam, who is up on the balcony. All right, Sam. Your days of smuggling gold dust off the Indian reservation are ended. All shoot, Rogers. You start a stampede and destroy your evidence against me. <laughs> Roy lowers his gun, and quickly Sam pulls his, fires several shots. The steers are terrified, and they gallop toward the stagecoach. Roy, seeing what's happened, moves fast. He rides Trigger over beside the lead horse, pulls him around, and gallops back into town. He swerves off the main street into an alley as the steers thunder behind, straight ahead, down the street. And Roy is safe. But Sam Teal is still up on the balcony. Suddenly, some of the steers gallop against the supports to the balcony, breaking them. It begins to fall. Sam shouts, Hey, the porch is caving! Help! 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 He falls to the ground beneath the feet of the trampling steer. A short time later, the sheriff returns and finds Roy waiting at his office with Denver and Hairpin Hobbs, the two outlaws who are now bound hand and foot. Roy hands them over to the sheriff, telling him a story. The sheriff exclaims, Smuggling gold in stage wheels, folks? Well, pretty clever. Well, thanks for your help, Rogers. Roy replies, Well, Hairpin and Denver Dan will fill in the details, sheriff. Trigger and I have business in Pine City. So long. You bet he was. He saved the stagecoach and the evidence from being destroyed by those steers, and he brought the outlaws into the sheriff. And Sam Teal thought he was going to be safe and that he would get Roy killed, and instead he got a taste of his own medicine. Yes. Well, next week now, Roy will be back again with a new adventure. So now, let's pick up the first page of the second section. Oh, yes, because there's Dagwood and Blondie, and I just love Dagwood. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <laughs> Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie says to the children, I wonder if Daddy remembers today's our wedding anniversary. Her daughter, Cookie, answers, Well, why not give him a hint? I'd be much happier if he thought of it by himself without hints. But I'm worried. Alex nudges Cookie and says, Hey, let's help Mom out. So they run upstairs. Go into the bathroom, last picture top row, where Dagwood is shaving. Alex says, Hey, you know whose anniversary is today, Pop? Dagwood replies, Well, can't be anybody important. Or our office would be closed. <laughs> First picture, second row. As Dagwood puts his hat and coat on, Blondie hands him a box. I fixed a lunch for you to take to the office, dear. Well, what a nice surprise. But he doesn't see the look of expectation in Blondie's eye. And away he goes to the office with a cheerful whistle. As Blondie closes the door with a sigh. Oh, dear. That noon, Dagwood opens his lunchbox. He finds a cupcake with a candle on it. He scratches his head and says to his boss, Dithers... Hey, why do you suppose Blondie put a cupcake with a candle on it in my lunch? Dithers replies, Dagwood, dear boy, I've been married 30 years, but I've never figured out why wives do what they do. Later in the day, last picture, second row, the kids come out into the kitchen, and Alexander says, Hey, we'll know pretty soon now, Mama, if Daddy forgot your anniversary or not. And a tear comes from Blondie's eye. I'll be heartbroken if he forgot. First picture, third row. Dagwood is on his way home from work. Ah, it's good to be on my way to my happy little home without a care in the world. Suddenly, a thief dashes out of a woman's hat shop with an armful of hats. Stop me! Stop me! The thief dashes down the street. He comes around the corner, last picture, third row, and smashes into Dagwood. Hey, what's the matter with you? The hats fall all over the street, and the thief jumps up and runs away. Leaving Dagwood, first picture, bottom row, alone on the street corner with the hat boxes lying all around him. Dagwood scratches his head, looks at the hats, and exclaims, Well, I'll have to find out the owner of all these hats and return them tomorrow. 
A short time later, Dagwood comes into the house. Alex sees all the boxes he's carrying. Hey, come quick, Mom. Pop didn't forget your wedding anniversary. And Dagwood goes... Last picture, Blondie is standing in front of a mirror, trying on one hat after the other. Oh, ah, mmm. What an original present. Ten beautiful hats. And Dagwood sits by, thinking what the hats will cost him, and he moans, Oh, I hope she doesn't like too many of them. <laughs> Poor Dagwood's in a spot. He can't tell her that he didn't buy the hats for her. No, Blondie <laughs> thinks the hats are all presents for her anniversary, and Dagwood can't tell her the real truth of the situation. <laughs> no wonder he looks unhappy. All oh, the funniest things happen to that Dagwood. Oh, they do, they do. <laughs> well, now let's turn over the page and go past the Lone Ranger, and there on page three of the second section is Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, and I'm very anxious to see what happens to Flash because he's on the planet Venus, which is very strange and weird. Yes, and he'd escaped from those strange fishmen that had pursued him. And he and Dale and Zarkov had stopped to rest under the giant leaves of a Venusian tree when a voice from a nearby bush ordered him to drop his gun. And the man said he was the king, he was the king stang of Venus, but Flash thinks he's an Earthman. And I just wonder whether Flash will give up. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Surrounded by the hidden followers of Stang, the self-styled King of Venus, Flash realizes it is hopeless to resist. He holds aloft his ray protector as a token of surrender after first secreting a small flame gun in his clothing. With a sudden beating of their wings, the Venusian tree men swoop down from their hidden perches. It's an eerie sight, and Dale cannot restrain a cry of fear and surprise. Flash urges her, I'll keep calm. If ever we need to clear heads, now is the time. Last picture top row, the three castaways face their captors. Stang comes out from behind a bush, and his first command dismays Flash. He orders, Search them! Hoping to divert Stang, Flash blurts a question. Wait, aren't you the rocket pilot from Earth whose expedition to the moon was lost in space? First picture bottom row, Stang snaps back. Lost? I don't make mistakes. I secretly plan to reach Venus and become its king. And I have. Flash's ruse succeeds as Stang says no more about searching his captives and orders them bound with vine ropes. And then when they're bound, motioning his aide, the Titian-haired Vicky, to follow, Stang takes off, airborne by his jet pusher. And Flash, Dale, and Zarkov suddenly find themselves being towed by the vine rope bonds high above the rainforest. After a few minutes of flying, a strange sight looms in the distance. They see a fantastically beautiful castle of colored plastic surrounded by a wide moat of burning liquid. Oh, I'm glad that Flash still has his small flame gun hidden on him. So am I, because I'm sure he's going to need it. Oh, look, the last picture. Isn't that an unusual castle they're coming to? I wonder what's inside that castle. Next week, we'll find out. Now, let's turn over the page. All right. Oh, look, on page five, there's Donald Duck. And here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze him, squeeze him, squiddy, chicka chack. Let's have music to fit a quack, quack. Donald has bought a sailplane which is a little airplane, like a glider, that you hook on behind a car. And as the car drives along, it pulls the sailplane up into the air, and then when you're going fast enough, you cut the plane loose and you sail along all by yourself. Well, fourth picture, top row, Donald is in his plane, and his girlfriend, Daisy, is in the car. And they're all set for the takeoff. Donald says, Now start slow and then step on it. Daisy starts to drive off. And in a few seconds, Donald's sailplane begins to go up in the air. Last picture top row, Donald shouts, I'm starting up! Faster! Daisy gives the car the gas. And away Donald sails. First picture bottom row, Donald's sailplane goes up higher and he shouts, Faster! Pour it on! Daisy goes faster, but Donald is an impatient boy and he shouts again, Faster! Faster! I'm almost ready to cut loose! Faster! And then, third picture, bottom row, his hat pops off in surprise, for he sees a wall right in front of him. And a second later, 
There lies Donald in his crashed ship on top of a tunnel hearing birds. And last picture, Daisy comes out of the tunnel that she had driven into. And without looking back, she shouts, Is this fast enough, Donald? <laughs> Isn't that funny? Daisy <laughs> drove through a little tunnel. And Donald didn't cut his rope loose from the car in time, and his sailplane was higher than the tunnel. <laughs> and wham, it hit the edge and pulled Donald right down smack against the side of the wall. <laughs> Oh, that was so funny. Yes, especially the look on his face was funny. Well, now let's turn over the page to Dick's adventures. Oh, yes. I'm anxious to see what's happening here, Dick, because he's in the early days of America with Lieutenant Oliver Perry, who's in the American Navy. And the British are at war with the Americans, and Oliver Perry has been given the job of defeating the British ships on Lake Erie. But Perry didn't have any ships, and so he had to build his own ships right on the shores of Lake Erie. And while he was building his ships, the Indians have reported to the British what he was doing. Now the British have sailed their ships right up to the harbor, waiting for the American ships to come out and fight. But Perry told the English that they could wait till kingdom come, and they've been waiting a long time. And now Perry must have the ships almost ready, so please see what he does next. All right, here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Finally, the building of two armed ships is finished. They are named the Lawrence and the Niagara. And now Perry's problem is to get his ships out into the harbor where he can attack the British. But a long, low sandbar stretches across the harbor. Perry's afraid to risk trying to get his ships across the sandbar for fear they may get stuck. If that happened, the British guns could pound them to pieces. First picture, second roll. Perry makes his tenth visit to the sentries in a single night. Dick, who's on duty, points to the British ship, saying, They're still out there waiting, sir. Finally, at midnight, Perry calls his officers and men together. Men, the British are not going away. But we're in luck. That onshore wind will give us plenty of water. We'll run the sandbar tonight. Last picture, second row, as they move to board ship, Dick well knows how daring is the plan, for the Lawrence and the Niagara need nine feet of water in order to cross the sandbar. But there's only six feet above the bar. Dick says, If we get stuck on that sandbar, the British will pawn us to pieces before we can get off. First picture, bottom row, two hours before dawn, with a favoring wind at its peak. The Lawrence, Perry's flagship, sets its head straight for the sandbar. Dick holds his breath. And then, last picture, starts to say, We're off! <laughs> this instant, the ship shudders from stem to stern. The Lawrence is stuck fast. Yes, and if the English see them there, Perry's ship could be blown to pieces. Yes, because they can't move or run away or anything like ships have to do when they fight at sea. Oh, Perry's in a dangerous spot if he doesn't get off that sandbar before the sun comes up. You think he will? Well, we'll have to wait till next week to find that out. But now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, and, and this I've been waiting to read because the race is soon going to be run that Rusty's going to ride in. And we'll soon find out if he'll win that thousand dollars to give to Mrs. Jones so she can pay off her debt to Mr. Marlowe. And uh, now Rusty's horse, Space Pilot, has new horseshoes. And, and I wonder whether he can run fast enough to win the race like that nice man Stovepipe said he would if he got new shoes. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. It's early in the morning, and Rusty and Pete are up with the sun. Rusty is saddled space pilot, and he says to his friend Pete, Why, right, come on now, Pete. This is the big day. Nobody else is up so we can give space pilot a workout on the fairgrounds track. All right, Rusty, as soon as I wash my face. A short time later, Rusty is giving space pilot a workout on the track. Space pilot whizzes around the track. Rusty says, Golly! Mr. Stovepipe was sure right about those shoes. 
Space Pilot is running like Whirlaway now. Meanwhile, while Rusty tells his friend Stovepipe how wonderfully Space Pilot is running, in the sheriff's office, the sheriff is talking to Mr. Marlowe. Well, there's your papers of foreclosure on the Jones farm, dated 5 p.m. today, Marlowe. Seems like you wouldn't need to be in such an all-fired hurry, her being a widow with a little child. That's my affair. You just be ready to go over there with me early, so she can't avoid being served. At that moment, third picture, bottom row, out at the Jones farm. Mrs. Jones opens her door to find a stranger. Well, howdy, ma'am. I'm looking for Rusty Riley and his pal Pete. I was told he was bunking here, am I right? Mrs. Jones answers, Oh, land sakes, yes, Rusty stopping here, taking care of some horses. Only him and Pete ain't home right now. Uh, would you care to wait for them? Last picture, Clem says, Oh, no, ma'am, I won't wait, but uh, I'll be back later. It's important. Just tell them Clem was here. They'll know. We were shipmates. Oh, yes, on the ship with the horses. They told me about you. Now, you'll be sure to come back now. <laughs> the fellow who was Rusty's friend on the ship when it was wrecked that time. So it looks like Rusty is another friend here. And the way that Mr. Marlowe is acting, it looks like Rusty needs a lot of friends, especially since tax isn't around. Oh, next week for sure, they, they must be winning the race so I can find out whether Rusty wins a thousand dollars. Well, let's hope so. Next week we'll find out. But now that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Chronic Biggie Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Pop the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.